Welcome to this IFRS Foundation podcast, which will focus on the September meeting of the International Accounting Standards Board. The meeting took place in London on the 19th and 20th of September 2018. My name is Matt Tilling and I'm the Director of Education here at the Foundation. Today I'm joined by the Chair of the Board, Hans Hugevost, and Vice Chair, Sue Lloyd, to talk through the latest meeting and other developments. The September meeting was the first board meeting in our new office in Canary Wharf. Before we go into the board discussions, Hans, how has the move from the city to Canary Wharf gone? Very well. We had to leave our old office. The uh, lease had expired uh, and it was really not fit for purpose anymore. It needed to be renovated completely. Instead, we chose um, to move to a new office space in uh, Canary Wharf. And while it, we were all a bit sad to leave the uh, city of London um, for, for Canary Wharf, uh, I must say uh, that the move has gone remarkably smooth. Uh, our staff did a fantastic job uh, uh, arranging this. And uh, our new offices here in Canary Wharf are, are much better, uh, more spacious, uh, and providing a very modern, open, uh, collaborative uh, environment. Uh, so uh, we are all very pleased. Uh, we had our first meeting in the new boardroom, uh, which is also less cramped than uh, the old one, um, and uh, with uh, very good technology. Uh, and we, uh, we look forward to many years of discussion and development of high quality standards in our high quality office space. And this month at the board, there really were two main topics of discussion, and I thought we might start with primary financial statements, Hans. Now, a number of topics linked to the project were discussed, and I wondered if you might take us through a couple of the highlights of that project. Well, first of all, we had uh, an extensive uh, discussion about how to apply something like EBIT for banks. Uh, As you know, we have been spending a lot of time to develop Um, a uh, subtotal for earnings before interest and taxation, which is basically operating income, widely used by uh, the investor community. Now, obviously, this will work for, let's say, normal companies, but for banks, uh, EBIT doesn't work. Nobody works with EBIT because interest is such a part of operating income for uh, banks that it makes no sense. So the staff has been trying to develop principles that would say, well, if you're, that would basically say if you're a bank, you don't need to worry about EBIT. And that is easy, more easily said than done, but uh, the staff made some very good proposals and I think we made very good progress in developing principles uh, for making this, this exception. Uh, staff will further develop uh, these principles and uh, will come back to the board at a later stage. We have also uh, spent quite a bit of time on um, discussing um, uh, possible development of requirements uh, for companies to present unusual or uh, infrequent uh, income and expenses in the statement of financial performance. This is some. This is information that, which is very important uh, for investors. They also investors always uh, like to see whether uh, the income of a company is persistent or not uh, in order to better predict uh, future cash flows. Uh, however, um, it is very difficult to uh, to develop uh, guidance uh, as or, or definition of what is unusual income, what is infrequent income. Uh, so we have asked the staff to uh, develop this guidance and uh, explore whether this can be done in a sensible way. Uh, so uh, still a lot of uh, work to be done before we can decide that we will introduce this in the financial statements. And, and finally, Hans, the board has decided to move the primary financial statements project from the research program to the standard setting program. Can you tell us a little bit about what this means for the project? Well, that means that... Um, we are sufficiently confident that we have clearly defined the issues, uh, that uh, we have identified that there is an accounting problem and that there is a solution in sight, uh, and that we feel sufficiently confident that we have developed sufficient ideas that we can reasonably sure that it will result in a standard. Uh, so uh, we are now sh- shifting from the research phase to the standard setting phase, which means that uh, we feel, uh, again, that we feel confident uh, that we can bring this project to a successful conclusion 
in the sense that we will develop a standard. Sue, I'd like to move on to the other main topic for discussion this week, dynamic risk management. And I want to start with a discussion that wasn't really part of the agenda as such, but the board had a really interesting conversation about the objective of this project and its scope. And, and really, is this project intended to capture all aspects of risk and risk management? No, it's not. So we're not thinking that we're going to be able to provide um, information about everything that's going on, but what we're trying to do is to provide better information about the impact that a company's risk management activities have on their economic resources, and in particular we're focusing on the impact of a bank's dynamic management of interest rate risk. Also what it isn't our job to do, and what we're not trying to do is to sort of opine on whether we not or not we think banks have got the right level of risk or they're making the right decisions about their risk management, but we want to help investors to better understand the risk management activities that are being undertaken and really to focus on how well management have achieved their risk management objectives. And this month the board discussed two key elements of the dynamic risk management project. Imperfect alignment was, was key to this. That's right and so maybe start with what imperfect alignment is, see, see how well I do. <laughs> so. Um, we start off with a bank designating particular assets and liabilities that it has as the focus for the dynamic risk management accounting. And they look at those assets and liabilities and work out what they want to achieve, what interest rate risk profile they want to take on. And that, given the assets and liabilities they have, um, there's a particular perfect derivative that if they entered into it would achieve the perfect outcome. Now, I use the word perfect loosely there. It's not the word we're going to use in our actual formal documentation, but that's the that's basic idea. What we're calling it is the benchmark derivative. And the idea of imperfect alignment is to say that we would take that benchmark or perfect derivative that would achieve the perfect outcome, and we compare that derivative with the derivatives they actually took out in practice and see how different those two things are. And that's really the information we're trying to capture with this idea of imperfect alignment. So the board agreed with the staff that that's the way that we should think about um, the reporting on dynamic risk management. We agreed that um, an entity should measure the um, mismatch between those derivatives on an ongoing basis and disclose information about the extent to which they've achieved their objectives and the extent of the mismatch between those derivatives. And in the case of overhedging, so say for example I needed to hedge risk of 100 and I actually took out a derivative of 110, so you had an over hedge. In that case, the difference in the fair value of your perfect derivative of 100 and your actual derivative of 110 would be presented in P&L as, as the indicator of imperfect alignment. So it's a bit like the idea of ineffectiveness we have today in hedge accounting. If there was under hedging, so if the derivative they entered into was, for example, too small compared with the perfect benchmark derivative, then that would, information would be provided about that through disclosure, um, similar to um, our approach to cash flow hedge accounting. We also decided that, that the banks would use qualitative and quantitative analysis on a prospective basis to determine whether or not the hedging that they were taking out would qualify for application of the model. Sue, one of the other topics that was discussed this month at the board was about the classification of liabilities. Can you tell us a little bit about that discussion? Yes, and so here we're talking about the classification of liabilities in the sense of what's a current liability and what's a non-current liability. And it's a project that we've been working on for a little while. We had an exposure draft a few years ago, and then we decided not to re-deliberate that until we finished the conceptual framework, which we've now done. So we're coming back to look at the comments we got um, on the exposure draft. And really what the staff did this week was to update us and remind us of where we got before and to get the board to agree on next steps. Uh, so it was a sort of reminding us of where we were. Uh, so we agreed on the, on the strategy going forward. And the other thing I'd like to note on this is sort of not from a technical front, but it was an important moment for us because it was the first time we'd had technical staff from our Asia Oceania office present a technical project at the board table. And so we were really pleased to be working with the staff there in this way. In addition to the board meeting, uh, this month, we've also had a meeting of the Interpretations Committee, and it was a, quite a full agenda with a lot of interesting topics, and I would certainly encourage anyone listening to go and read the update that's available on our website. 
But I would like to pick up on a couple of the topics, and, and one of them seems to be a topic that really is a, a topic of interest at the moment in, in many different fields, and that's cryptocurrencies. So the board talked about cryptocurrencies, I think it was in July, and the outcome of that discussion was to ask the Interpretations Committee whether they would do some analysis for us on the current accounting under our standards for um, cryptocurrencies and also for initial coin offerings and for the committee to give us their thoughts on whether that resulted in useful information and whether they had any suggestions for us to think about from a standard setting perspective. So it's a bit of an unusual um, discussion for the committee. We weren't asking them to think about standard setting per se or to issue an agenda decision, but rather to give information for the board. So we had an interesting discussion about the application of our existing standards and uh, the committee had quite a few suggestions for us about what we should do or not do on uh, some future standard setting. So the next step on that will be the staff will report back to the board what the committee has suggested. There were a number of other interesting topics that were discussed and those include liabilities in relation to a joint operator's interest in a joint operation and also a completely different topic, the determination of exchange rate when there is a long-term lack of exchangeability, which on the surface seemed like mouthfuls, but I think both of them had some interesting aspects. Yeah, both really interesting questions and both live questions in the market, so I think really recommend that people have a look at the work the committee's done here. But to touch on them both uh, briefly, so on the um, joint operator question, we looked at a very specific question, and this was um, about the case where there's a joint operation and the lead operator in the joint operation enters into a lease of a piece of equipment. Um, it signs the document, but it's done so with a view to the asset being used by the joint operation. And the question that came to us is what should the lead operator put in its financial statements? And the committee concluded that there's uh, sufficient guidance in our existing standards, so we don't need to do standard setting. But perhaps more importantly, they also concluded that the lead operator in that case would recognise the entire lease liability in its financial statements. Now, it's important to point out that that's a tentative agenda decision, so that's now out for comment, so people who are interested in that should um, comment, um, and it will be subsequently deliberated again by the committee. The other um, topic that you mentioned was about... Um, exchange rates where there's a long-term lack of exchangeability and this was a very specific discussion about the um, difficult situation that we have in Venezuela at the moment and what companies should be doing when they are presenting their results about translating and what exchange rate do they use in a country with the situation Venezuela has. And the committee answered a very specific question and the, and the question that the committee answered was that in the situation with a fact pattern like Venezuela, and they're very specific that it's about Venezuela, a preparer needs to look at the official exchange rate and see whether it meets the definition of a closing rate. So don't just use it blindly. And what does that mean in layman's speak? We're really saying, does the preparer have the ability to access that exchange rate and actually exchange currency at that rate? Now that, of course, uh, so that's a, a final agenda decision on that very specific point. That then, of course, leaves open the question, well, if you conclude it's not the closing rate, what do you do? And the committee has agreed to do some further um, research on this and to look at potential narrow scope standard setting to talk about what you do in those situations as a second step. And again, there's a, a much fuller discussion and a number of other very interesting topics that are available <coughs> in the update. Hans, before we finish, I think it's worth mentioning a number of other events. It is a very busy time for the board and the foundation. First, there was a meeting of the Advisory Council. Yes, uh, in early September we had a, a meeting uh, with our Advisory Council on strategic issues. And as usual, uh, we got a lot of good advice uh, by the Council. Uh, we talked about, for, uh, for example, the issue of timeliness of our standard setting, uh, if there is one issue of criticism of, of the, uh, on the board is that often we don't meet our deadlines. Uh, on the other hand, we uh, also want to fully engage with our stakeholders and our stakeholders often ask for more time to respond to our questions. Uh, so um, we asked the, uh, the, the advisory council how to deal with these two possibly conflicting uh, demands on our, uh, on, on our work. 
and how to balance uh, timeliness with proper due process. And we got a lot of uh, good uh, suggestions on, uh, on, on, in, in that respect. We also talked about the way in which we engage with our stakeholders, our comment letter uh, process, how we can uh, possibly improve that with better use of technology, uh, and whether we should have a more flexible approach to different kinds of stakeholders, preparers, investors, etc. And of course, if you're interested to find out more about the discussions at the Advisory Council, there is another podcast available uh, where we talk with Joanna Perry about those discussions. Hans, in the first week of October, we have our annual World Standards Setters Conference, a very big and important conference for us. Yeah, that is uh, always a very uh, interesting conference. Uh, We have uh, more than 100 delegates from over 50 countries, in addition to a number of representatives of international organizations. Uh, They come to talk to to us about all the issues that we are working on. We will uh, discuss a wide range of topics, among which, for example, the conceptual framework, and uh, delegates will receive updates on our uh, projects. It's a conference with a high content of uh, education. And it's just a, a really fantastic uh, event, uh, allowing us to engage with a uh, key stakeholder group, uh, many of whom we don't see uh, on a regular basis. Uh, so it's a very good uh, occasion to catch up with people. And. On the heels of that, we're also going to have our trustee meeting in South Africa. Yeah, we'll have a trustee meeting in uh, Johannesburg. Uh, It's a very important meeting. It's the last meeting that will be chaired by our uh, chairman of trustees, Michel Prada. Uh, Unfortunately, he is leaving us. Uh, I have worked with uh, Michel for more than 10 years, also in my previous work as a securities regulator in the Netherlands. And uh, Michel has been a fantastic uh, person to, um, to work with, a uh, lot of wisdom and uh, fantastic personal qualities. So uh, I will personally miss him very much, but uh, also the, uh, uh, the organization as a whole. Fortunately, we have found a, a, a very good successor to uh, Michel, uh, Mr. Erki Likanen, um, uh, former uh, governor of the Central Bank of uh, Finland who has also been a um, uh, commissioner in uh, Europe, uh, so a person who knows all the issues and uh, who is very well uh, connected. And uh, I'm sure that we, uh, I will be able to work with him uh, as well as I did with Michel and that he will be a very effective uh, chairman of the trustees. Well, that brings us to the end of the September podcast. Thank you, Hans and Sue, and thank you to our listeners. Any feedback on these podcasts? please email communications at ifrs.org. As always, the full summary of the board's discussion and the decisions at the September meeting can be found in the ISB update on the IFRS Foundation's website. Thank you very much.